Okay, so we're doing CSS 27, right? Uh, one thing I added are office hours. Uh, the office hours here, uh, right here. If you click on the link next to the syllabus, and eventually it opens it, it looks like this. All right, so everything in green are my office hours. So for about half an hour today and then on Thursday and then the other ones on Monday and Wednesday are a little bit longer. Subject to change, if you need me more time, I can stay extra or we can move these around a little. But that's the general idea. So if you have any questions other than, you know, send me emails, you're welcome to come see me in the office hours. So uh, that's the office hours business. Now we kind of went through week one. Okay. So uh, week one was basically installing Java, setting up the path on Windows, all that good stuff. Uh, a little quiz in there from the material we'll cover to put a picture, tell me about you, all that good stuff. Okay. Uh, and what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about some other things. All right. So uh, this week, the plan is to learn about array encapsulation and the abstract data type bag and, you know, do some, some of that with these two assignments. So abstract data type bag is, so first of all, do you remember the difference between an abstract data type and a data structure? Abstract data type was the, uh, the data in memory and the other was how to use a data. Okay, so abstract data type is how things are gonna work. Basically, if you have like a real world situation where you have a line of people, right? That's an abstract data type, all right? I have, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have a line of people, people are gonna come from the end and they're gonna leave at the front, or maybe we're gonna have a stack of plates, we're gonna put them in a certain way, we're gonna always put the last last one on top and then we start washing them we remove them top one first right so that's last one in last one in first one out right the other one was first one in first one out uh, and there's also a bag right it's an abstract data type of a, a collection of items right so a general collection of items that's the abstract data type bag and what are some of the things that we're supposed to do with with a bag? Well, you can look through the bag. You can right. You can count how many things are in the bag. You can put things inside of the bag. You can take things out of the bag. There isn't a particular order in the bag, right? So they're not inserted in the ascending or descending order or alphabetical or whatever. They're just kind of in random order. So order is not important. Uh, but you have to insert search and you know those kind of things through a bag and uh, so to do this uh, if you actually look through the assignments well actually let me just have a look at um, this little lecture that I have in here what what do I want to tell you from the book okay so I guess this chapter in the textbook kind of, and I, that's why one of the reasons I like the book is it, it starts slow and it keeps it easy. Okay, so it explains things about arrays, right? How we create arrays in Java, okay? Uh, how we can check the length of, of, of an array in Java, how we can uh, access array elements using the index, right? All things you should know, right? The index is whatever's inside the square bracket how you can uh, initialize arrays to a, a certain size, right? One way to do it is you tell it, okay, it's gonna have 4,000 things. Another way to do it is you tell it, okay, and with curly brackets, you list the elements of the array. So, right, these are all the elements of the array. 
uh, this, the zero is the first element, three is second, C is third, right? The first element of the array is found using index zero. The last element of the array is the array length, which was this, minus one. Okay, so if you have 10 things in the array, first one is zero, last one is nine. That's called a vector. There, there is no, not for the array itself. There, so can you resize the array to give it a, you know, so make it expand? You could create a vector. Vector is like an array which expands and contracts. Okay, but the problem with vectors are they kind of double up. So let's say you have a vector of four things and you want to add one and it will double itself up to like eight. So sometimes it adds more than you need it to. And for that purpose, uh, we're going to kind of stick with arrays and we are going to create the illusion of resizing the array. So what we're going to really do is we're just going to make an array big enough and just so that, and the purpose for this is, for me it's important that you understand how to shift things around the array and so that you understand how insertion of, in, in, in an array take, is uh, time consuming, how deleting from an array is also time consuming so that that's the reason that we're, I'm going to start using uh, linked lists at some point because of that. Okay, and we'll do that today. So one of the things that I'm going to do today is I'm going to have an array. I'm going to, you know, basically let's say I have an array of ten. Okay, but I'm going to start with like five things in it. Then I'm going to add one. I'm going to inst I'm going to remove one. Th those kind of things. Okay. Uh, so. Primary algorithms used for arrays. You have you can search through an array. You can insert. You can delete. Okay, uh, inserting and deleting in the beginning is very time consuming because you have to kind of shift all the elements to the right spot. Uh, searching and delete. Searching is uh, depending on what searching algorithm you have or how how the uh, arrangement of your data is. Searching could be quick or it could be slow. Okay, it really depends on how you arrange the data, how efficient your searching is going to be. That's why arrangement and this data structure of how we put the data together is very important. Uh, all right, so the bottom line here is, um, what we're gonna do is, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have, first the book talks about, let me see if I have it somewhere in there. Okay, so let's say this. So, without looking at a specific example, you can have an array and you can interact with that array. You can insert things in it. You can do things to the array. But, you can also encapsulate the array. So what we're going to do is we're going to get the array, we're going to put it inside of a class, and that's kind of like what Java does, right? We put everything inside of a class. And then we're only going to be able to do things to the array using the methods. So the, the array is the properties of the object and the actions are the methods. So we're only going to have certain actions possible to that array. So if somebody's trying to delete from an array that's empty, you tell them there's nothing in the array. Or if you try, somebody's trying to insert into an array that's already full to the, to the max, you can tell them, no, I can't insert anymore. So it's basically we're going to have some kind of fail-safe mechanisms preventing the program from breaking. So we're going to encapsulate the array inside of a, an object and then uh, work on that object. And that's what this chapter talks about, really. Uh, so it talks about interfaces, okay, and how like, you know, you have your array buried inside of the object class, right? And there's different things that you can do. You can set the element, you can get the element, right? Um, and that's the interface, the data is private. Okay, uh, and uh, then the book talks about different kinds of searches. So I told you that arrangement of data is important. So if we have a linear search of things, let's say you have a hot, you have a hundred things, right? You have a hundred numbers randomly arranged, and I tell you, okay, guess a number. Could get, you could have worst case scenario up to 99 guesses, right? Because they're not arranged in any particular order. But if I had 
been careful and I set up an algorithm that inserts numbers in a ascending or descending order and I have a sorted array, then I can do a binary search. What's the binary search? You remember? It's divide the number in half. Yeah, you divide the number in half. All right, all right, I tell you pick a number and you're going, all right, between a zero and a hundred. And your first guess should be half, 50. And I tell you, no, it's higher than that. So then your next go number will be all right. Now my next guess should be between 50 to 100. My next guess should be 75. Okay, and I tell you, no, it's lower than that. Now the next guess is between 75 and 50. And you keep dividing it in halves and halves and halves, and then at the end, you're only left with a few numbers to guess from. So ultimately, if you have 100 numbers and you have a binary search, it'll take you no more than seven to get it right. Versus if you have you know, the linear search, you can go up to 99 guesses. Okay, so arrangement is very important. That's what this thing is telling you. Uh, and there is an example here of array, uh, an ordered array. So it's basically finding where to insert thing in, a, in an uh, ascending order or descending, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, and this stuff is all in the textbook. Uh, and then there's also a binary search algorithm. And these are kind of assignments that you have done in my previous programming classes, hopefully. Okay. But it's not very hard. Okay. Just changing the, you're all, all you're doing is you're dividing the upper and the lower bound conditions by half every time, every time you have a guess and you're accepting new guess until you get it right. Uh, so some of these advantages and disadvantages of arrays uh, and that ties in with the efficiencies of algorithms which is the big O okay so searching is pretty fast in an ordered array because you can do the binary search uh, but that is if it's an ordered array okay searching an unordered array is pretty time-consuming okay the disadvantage of an ordered array is insertion time takes longer. You have to find the right place, then you have to shift all the elements to the right, and then you have to insert the, the thing that you're trying to insert. Okay, same thing with deletion. If you're trying to delete the first one, you delete the first one, then you move the second one to the first one's spot, then you move the third one to the second one's spot, and so on and so on and so on. Okay, so that's what happens, and uh, I have a little array delete insert picture thing right here top one and that kind of explains you know the situation so let's say suppose we have an array of four things right in here I'm just saying I'm showing as if there are three things right so what I have to do is so let's say I'm deleting I'm deleting the four here right what I have to do is I'm gonna delete this thing by shifting the three to the first spot and the five to the second spot, and then I have to resize the array. So basically the array is gonna go from four, three, five to three, five, and then I resize it. I'm not going to really resize the array. I'm just going to have some kind of a variable in there that keeps track of how many things are in the, in the array, right? And that's basically going to affect how I show the array, right? So when I change the size, when I delete this thing, I change the actual number of elements to minus minus, one less, and then the array shows like this, okay? And if you wanna, so basically the, the easiest thing to do is to visualize a lot of these is to just start with a very simple example, right? This is my example, four, three, five. How am I going to accomplish this shift? Well, I'm going to make the A0 equal to the A1, and then I'm gonna make the A1 equal to the A2, and then you're gonna go from 435 to 355. And that's it, right? Then, after I've done this business, then I go num elements minus minus, and then we can show the array in this shape, okay? And this here is basically the loop that how we're gonna do this. Remember the index goes 0, 1, 2, right? So my I, if this is my I, goes from zero to one, right? So if I have three elements, I did it two times. So that means that I would set up a loop. If I have many of these, I would set up a loop that starts at zero, goes to num elements minus one, and then plus plus, and then I can just do this inside of my loop, right? So 
that's the shift for deleting a key from an element or an, el or an array. Any questions? Make sense? But the, the size of the array is still... The size of the array is still whatever it was originally, but num elements is now reduced. So let's say we have a size of four, but number of elements is three. So you have an array, something like this. Yes, you can insert something else onto that array. Okay. But yeah, the size, we're not really changing the size. So the little key is the range and the four is the yes. one. Yes, the real key is that the loop goes from zero to number of elements minus one. And then you just do a square brackets i is equal to a square brackets i plus one to do the actual shift. Okay? It doesn't have to be zero. Zero is only if I'm inserting at the zero place. Right? If I'm inserting at the first place or at index one, then i changes to one, okay? But I'm showing you the worst case scenario. And this is kind of what the book is doing. They have one loop which finds where the i is. So basically they're going, they're, they were doing something like inserting an order. So keep going, keep going, keep going until you find the right spot where you can insert this number in, in the correct order. And then you use that, so one loop was to find that index. And then there was another loop which goes and does this kind of a business to do the shifting business. Okay, so this is the delete, and there is another one. Let's say we have three an array, same business. We have num, num elements is three, size is four, so we can add one more element, right? So let's say my array is something like this, four, three, five. And remember, since the size is actually four, there's an extra one in the end also, but because of num elements is three, I could show the array like this, okay? So num elements is basically dictates how I'm going to draw these curly brackets. All it is, it's I have like a show, show array function that is driven by how many elements we want to show. Okay, so how am I going to do the shifting for insertion? Well, the shifting for deletion was you start at the one next to the one that you're going to delete and you move them one by one, left to right. Okay, on this one, you're going to start at the last one and you're going to move them right to left. So this one, last one gets moved to this spot. This one, the three gets moved to the spot of the five. The four gets moved to the spot of the three. Okay. And the index of my arrays or the index of my array is zero, one, two, three. Okay. So just like I did with the other one here, how I did it, I, I wrote, I wrote down the different elements that I'm going to change and shift, right? So that I can visualize where my eye starts right and where it ends so i started at zero here and ended at one here i'm going to do the same thing for my you know for this year and again to visualize this you don't have to do it in your head start with something simple just you know a set of three numbers see how you can shift them write it out one by one then once you have this thing set up right this is the, the setup then you can write a loop for it okay but anyway here's what we're trying to do so we're trying to insert at zero, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is, I said I gotta move the five to the empty slot. So that means that A3 is equal to A2. Then I gotta move the three to the spot of the five. That's A2 is equal to A1. Then I have to move the four at the spot of the three. That's A1 is equal to A0. And that's where it ends. Now the shift is done, okay? If I want to, I can go ahead and call this my I. All right, so I goes two one zero, All right, and this other one is just an I plus one, which goes three two one. So this here, the I is going to help me set up my loop. Okay, so my I started at num elements minus one, right? So I have four things, right? Four minus one or whatever the last one is, num elements minus one. Right, that was this one here. Okay, so basically we started the last one, we go on while i is greater than or equal to zero, basically until we get to zero, right? That's my last value of i. And we're going backwards, minus minus. And then all I'm doing is I'm saying i ai plus one is equal to ai, which is this business that I did here. Okay, so if you, if you actually want to visualize the steps, right, at the first step, this is what happens. You have four, three, five, five. We move the five here. Then we have four, three, three, five. We move the three here. 
Then the one on the bottom, we have four, four, three, five. We move the four here. And now at this point, what we're gonna do is we wanna insert something in here. Let's say we wanna insert the number 10. That's the last step. Insert wherever you wanna insert, whatever it is that you wanna insert. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. So this is the illustration of how inserting into an array of you know things can be time consuming. Same thing with, de with deleting, okay? So every data structure, the, every data type of data structure that we're going to encounter has some advantages and disadvantages. There isn't like a one solution for all of them. It just doesn't work out nice, you know? For arrays, it's very easy if you, ha if you have like a number sorted already and you're trying to like access a specific element. So let's say I have 10,000 things and I'm going to look at number 999, whatever. I can ju jump directly to that index without going through all the different elements of the array. But searching becomes slow if you're trying to search through an unordered array. Inserting is slow if you're trying to do the orderly insert. Deleting is slow, right? There's different, different things that, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages. So that's that. The insertion, sorting, okay, lecture two, okay. The big O notation, okay, so the big Sorry. O notation, Before yes. Before we move the big O yeah. under searching, I have a question. What's up? Um, this may have been already covered, perhaps you just move sure. it real quick. I noticed that in the screen, when you're searching for an item and a second item, you don't use the equal equals, you use so yes. equals, can you just kind of touch on that? Yeah, okay, so in, in uh, let me fire up. Yeah, I'll do it in Sublime. So, class search string. Okay. And you have public, static, void, main, string, args. Let me save this. This is search string. Java. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my terminal. Okay. So Java C search string, Java, Java search string. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is, should have made this bigger earlier. Uh, so I'm searching, I'm, I'm trying to find uh, if one string is equal to another string. So I'm gonna have a string S1 is equal to hello. And then you have string S2 is equal to uppercase hello. Okay. And maybe I should have done this in uh, Eclipse. So let me do this. And the reason for this is because, and by the way, I kind of uh, did some of this stuff, uh, some of your assignments in here, so I'll, I guess I'll show you that while we're at it. Search string, throw that in there. Okay, so let's go look at the strings real quick. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if S1 equals equals S2 uh, system out print ln they are equal. Okay, so the moral of the story is you cannot compare strings like this in Java. Okay, let's hope it work. Hope let's hope it doesn't work. Run it. What happened to this thing? Why is 
this not working? Oh, because they're not equal, right? This doesn't show off. All right, so let's do this. So you cannot, cannot use equal equal to compare strengths. Okay, it actually worked this time. It works sometimes. It works all the time, 60% of the time. Okay, so don't use double, double, double equal to compare strengths. The way we're gonna do it is you do this. You say if S1 dot, and that's why I picked Eclipse because it does this kind of magic for you. So as soon as you do the dot, it has different things you can do with the string, right? You can check to see if a, if a string is empty, if a string contains a certain character sequence, uh, if it starts with something, you can look at the length of that. You can look at the character at a specific element of that, you know, string array, if you want to call it that. Uh, and there's also the equals, right? Let's do equals ignores case, right? So this the first string is the hello, second string is the S2, right? Are they two? Are these two equal? Ignoring the case, I don't know. Run the thing. They're equal, and then try it again. Equals. All right now it shouldn't show anything because they're not equal. Ignoring the case. Okay, so moral of the story is can't use double double to compare strings. Double double works for uh, the basically the the basic data types. Okay, uh, and the reason it doesn't work for strings is because strings are objects, right? Let's say you have a string or an object dog, and then you made an instance of that dog, German Shepherd, and then you have another instance of the dog called Chihuahua. Well, can you check to see if dog equals equals Chihuahua? No. Same way, you can't check to see if one string is equal to another string. You can't compare objects with the equal equal sign. You could do it this way, right? Basically, you create a method in one, inside the object, and inside and using that method, you can check to see if one thing is equal to another thing. Okay, it saves a whole lot of headache compared to how things are done in C++. In C++, you could override the equal, the equal operator. Right, the 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 assignment or the, the double equal, you can uh, you can override any operator in C plus plus, minus the plus, the division, the equal equal, the not equal, greater than, less than. You can redefine how the language works if you want to. Okay, Java has one way to do things, and that way it works very nicely. So why why go through all that other hassle? So anyway, equals is how we compare strings. Now the other one. Let's go back to the little thing here. Okay, so big O notation. <coughs> so big O notation is how we measure the performance of algorithms. How we're gonna measure if this search algorithm is as fast as another search algorithm. How we're gonna do it? We're gonna put a stopwatch and check how long it runs? No, there's ways for us to look at the actual algorithms and determine how many times this loop happens. How many times does this other loop happen? Well, if this loop happens n times and this other loop happens n times and there are one loop inside of another loop, you have n times n, which is n squared. That will be the efficiency or the big O notation of your bubble search, uh, bubble sort. Remember, bubble sort, you have one for loop inside of another for loop and you sort the thing. Well, one loop happens n times, the other loop happens n times approximately n times n is n squared, which is actually the slowest possible al algorithm as far as sorting is concerned, okay? Uh, and what they're talking about here is basically uh, that you could have a loop that happens n times, but maybe it's like n divided by two, but for really big numbers, n, you know, you can just call it, you can, you can put this divi divis divisible by two inside of the constant, and then you can say k times n, right? So, and then at some point when, you, when the n becomes really, 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 really big, k, the k, the constant, really doesn't matter, okay? Uh, and that's basically what this is. 
Um, and it talks about the different efficiency and there's like a little table in there for you to see uh, what is the most efficient and the least efficient uh, types of big O notation, right? The N squared one, right? That one's really, really steeply grow growing. So this one is very slow. This is the N one, which is kind of linear. That's a little bit better. Then you have the log N, which is, you know, even better than the, the big old notation of, of N. And then finally, you also have just a steady, always, always is one, okay? That's basically as quick as it gets, okay? So these are some different uh, relationships uh, of the big O notation, different different types of algorithms and their efficiencies. Uh, so programming projects to the high class and the high array Java and a method called get max. So there's a sample program, high array Java. You gotta type it up, you gotta get it to work. Uh, you're gonna add a method which returns the max and chain, check that from the main, make sure it works. Turn in your sample output. Uh, and then modify it so that the item, and this is basically, uh, it, it deals with this high array business is a bag of sorts. Okay, it's, it's a collection of things. You're gonna go through them, you're gonna find the max, you're gonna return it. That's the first piece. Then the second one is, you're not only going to find the max and return it, you're also going to remove it out of the bag. Okay, and the removing business is gonna involve this deleting and shifting thing that I showed you. Okay, uh, and that's pretty much all there is. Uh, what I wanna show you, other than this, is, uh, let me have a look, implement a bag of items. So, complete. Complete and submit part four, making an array of item objects from the review exercises. So I give you the review exercises here. This was from last week, right? Remember I told you you should get started on this stuff as early as possible, because we're gonna do it for real this week. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of you know walk through this. Uh, and I have also posted the solutions and I think next week for this, so you can look at them if you get stuck. Okay, so the bottom line is there's different pieces to this assignment. First one tells you, okay, we're gonna have a bag of things, called, they're calling it grocery checkout or whatever. Uh, and we're gonna have an array of things. We're gonna have an array of strings and array of prices, right? It will look like this, right? So one, one array here, one array is for the names, another array is for the costs, right? So they're telling you, okay, well first, create these two parallel arrays, ask the user to enter information into them, and then if there is a, where does it show that? Oh yeah, right here. If if there's peace in, inside your bag, then you're supposed to find the average price for all these different things, all right? So you're gonna have to search through the bag, look for peace, if there is peace, add up all the numbers, find the average, okay? Uh, so let's have a look at this real quick. So first of all, going down, where is this part two? Okay, so here we go. We have uh, right here, you have two different arrays. One array is of strings, one array is of doubles. This is how we're making them, right? So we're gonna ask the user how many numbers they want into this array, and then we declare an array of that size, okay? Then, and by the way, I'm using the scanner for input, because it's easier than the buffer reader input, right? To get my number of items. And then I'm gonna use this number of items to declare my arrays, and to then loop num item times and ask the user to enter the name for each of these items and the price for each of these different items. I could have asked it as one big string and then split the string into pieces and then done all that stuff, but I figured let's just keep it easy. I'm just gonna do this, okay? So two inputs, one for the names, one for the prices, okay? So those are my arrays. The next piece is it tells you look for piece 
And if you find piece, that's this piece here, right? The ignores equals case that I just showed you, right? So we're comparing one string, which is my name square brackets i, each element of the name strings. And I'm comparing it to this string pattern here, piece. And I'm ignoring the case in case they entered it in some mixed case. If I find it, then I am just going to set this variable has piece to true, okay? What I'm doing is I'm finding the sum for every one of these, right? So I'm summing up all the prices just in case I find piece. And then if I find a piece, I'm gonna show you, oh, the average price is the sum divided by prices times length, which is the average of, you know, the sum of all things divided by how many things we have, okay? Uh, then <clears throat> the assignment asks you to put this calculation business inside of a method. It didn't really say what kind of a method really uh, or how the method should be written. So there you go. There's a, oh, but it said it should be a static method. Okay. Why, why are these methods static? Because I can just call them from the main, right? So if I wanted to call the averages method, I just call it like that. If they were not static, I have to make, I have to make objects and then call them and then use the objects to call the, to call the, method. Does that make sense? Say no if he, if he doesn't. No. Okay. So for example, let's say I have a, what variable do I have in here? Name uh, or whatever. What's this here? Class bag. So let's say this. I'm going to say uh, void hello. All right. And then this thing is going to do system out print ln hello all right that's all it does okay now I'm gonna try and I'm going to try to call my hello method from here I do hello da -da. no doesn't like it why doesn't it like it because it says cannot make a static reference to a non-static method blah 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 and Eclipse is so awesome that it even tells you a fix I'll oh, change this to static click and now I can call it. Okay, so if I wanted to call a method just like this, it has to be static. Okay, but there's another way. I can just say, all right, well, this is my main. I'm going to create a new instance or a new bag object. I'm going to say bag sum bag is equal to new bag. Okay, and then I'm going to say sum bag dot hello and now I can call it that's what I was saying yes but what if you have a, an instance of bag one and bag two and you call the hello I, I would know which one and you make the hello uh, method static I would know which one to pick uh, this, the, okay when you have a static thing it belongs to all of the objects so if you if you really did have a static hello then it would belong to all the objects at the same time if you do not have static then the hello belongs to each individual object itself so we have two instances say some bag one mm -hmm. some bag two mm -hmm. and then you call it hello yeah who, who does it belong to Both okay uh so let's do let's just just do this what i'm going to do is i don't know i'm going to have an int a num is equal to whatever. Okay, a num is equal to. It's a bad example, but whatever. Okay, a num is here. Uh, I'm gonna make a constructor just for kicks. So I'm gonna say uh, bag bag new int new num, and then I do a num is equal to new num, okay? And then I'm gonna make two different bags. So some bag one, this one's gonna have the value of one. Some bag one, hello. And then in the hello, I'm going to show you num equals num, okay? Did I call it num? I call it a num. Okay, uh, and then I'm gonna have, when I run this thing, 
num is equal to one, right? Okay, then I'm gonna make a new one. I'm just gonna copy the whole thing. So I'm back two. This one is a two. And now I'm gonna call the two. And then when I run this thing, now you can see that it knows. I meant without the sum bag one dot and without the sum bag two dot. You can't call it. Yeah, if you, it, yeah, okay. So you said, now what if we make this a static method? Static void hello two. Something like that, right? Let's see what happens. So first of all, put this here. I'm going to try to call the static method just by itself here, right? Hello two, just like that. Okay, what is it going to show me? Huh? Let's find out. But the one, what's the error? And, um, yeah, it, it wants its own static. It wants it wants to make it a static variable. Uh, let's make a and num static. Okay, and then num static here. Num static is equal to new num also. Just like that, right? Okay, so then I'm going to change my hello, where's the hello business? Num static. Now it's going to be what? What do I call it? Oh, static. You can't just name it static and you think it's going to be static. Okay, so now it's a static variable, num static. All right, so it's happy. So when I call this, keep in mind that I'm not I'm not giving it a new value when I from the constructor. I have at this point when I'm here, I haven't even done anything with the constructor. Right? I have not evoked this piece of code yet. So what is going to be the value that this thing here shows me? Zero. Okay, and that's one of the things about static variables. So first of all, what is a static variable? This here, this is an instance variable. Okay, and this one here is called a class variable. Okay, so a, a class variable has the keyword static in front of it. Okay, a class variable belongs to all the objects. So some bag is going to have the same value, some bag two is going to have the same value. If I what I mean is if I change the num static for this bag, it will also change it for the other bag. Okay? But if I change a num in one of the bags, it's not going to affect a num in any of the other bags. Okay? Now this is something we covered in the first Java class. Okay, so not a super important thing as far as the this class is concerned, but you should know it, right? Very important to know what a static variable is. What's the what's an instance variable? An instance variable does not have the word static, and that's an example of an instance variable. So any bag will have its own a num variable. If I change a num in in bag one, it does not change it for bag two. If I change a num in bag two, it does not change it for a num for, for bag one. It's not the case for the static variables. If I change my static variable in bag one, it changes it for bag two. If I change it for bag two, it changes it for bag one. Okay? Static variables are initialized to zero. So they exist, right? They exist before any objects are created. So here I'm creating an instance some bag one, here I'm creating an instance some bag two, right? I haven't created any instances here yet, but the variable is equal to zero. Let's run it. Right here. That's the zero. Okay, maybe I should have named it something else. Num static. Alright. Num static is zero, right? So it's equal to zero. So what I'm going to do is, 
then what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go and try to call this like he said try to call it with an object so in some bag one I am going to change num static to one right when I do this when I do this piece we're calling the default constructor and we're making num static equal to whatever number so at that point this num static should change from zero which was which it was originally to one which is what I gave it okay now let's try to call it the way you want it so I'm gonna go in there I'm gonna do all right some bag one dot hello two see if it takes it yeah it takes it all right so then when I run this thing you're gonna see that num static is equal to whatever this value is so this one here shows you num is equal to one right this one here is going to show me num static is equal to one if you don't believe it run it num static is one okay now let's go and have a look at this here I'm gonna say some bag two hello two All right so now what is the value of num num static two, two hopefully All right, here's your num static too. Okay, so it seems like you're paying attention. Then what if I did this? Sum bag one, hello two. What is it now? Two. Two. Okay, good. You got it. You got the. You got how the static works. Any questions? Okay. So basically, this here. Uh, this piece right here, this piece of code, changes my num static variable to two for sum bag two. Okay, but changing num static here also changes it for my other bag because the static variable is shared by all the different objects. So sum bag one and sum bag two both share the same static variable. Changing it for one changes it for both of them. Okay, so static static and non-static okay so what else what else what else uh all right so we got the piece we did the math with the pieces with the piece with it we called the method right which was mat which was made a static so that you can call it like this without making an object and then calling it like that not that you can't but that was that's what the assignment asked uh and then the next thing is they're saying now, well, hold on, this was not a very efficient way to do things. Okay, what well, we can do is, one second. One second. Okay, so, all right, it's recording. The other part of the assignment is basically telling you, okay, we created two parallel arrays but that is not the most elegant or efficient way to do things so why don't we do something else what we're going to do is we're going to create an item class right here somewhere so there's my item class and that item class is going to have its own two variables name and price okay and I'm going to have a constructor that allows me to set the name and the price when I create a new item and then I'm going to have some accessors to access the information that's inside of my item class, right? The name and the price variables, and mutators to change those if I wanted to. All right? Just like any any Java class or just like any class, you have your variables and you have ways to change and see those variables. All right. So next thing is now that I have the items class, go to my main, all right? I'm going to create a new item, right? Item on item is equal to new item, right? That uses the default constructor. And because I went in there and I added a two string method, which is this piece right here. Actually, let me collapse some of these maybe. Should I collapse this? Collapse, collapse some of these so it's easier to read. All right, so Remember the two string method? 
Anyone have any questions on the two string method? Do you remember how it works? All right, I'll take that as a no. So let's say I go in there and I am going to look at this piece of code right here. So this line, I'm, I'm saying system on print ln and uh, an item, okay? And let me just do this. Okay, so we know where it is. So if I run this thing, oh, it's probably gonna ask me to enter a bunch of crap. Eesh. One item. One, one ninety-nine. Okay, so this here, this an item is equal to grapes is equal to two whatever. That is this piece. Okay, so I created an item grapes two forty. Okay, and I was able to show it just using the object name. Okay, but what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go and I'm gonna take out the two string method. It doesn't exist, right? I'm gonna try to run the, th the program again. Okay, again, it wants me to enter something. One, oops, damn. Uh, how many items? Oops, that's supposed to be a number. How many not? items one one 199 see this is how an object will show itself that was this piece of code right here okay so it's saying an item is equal to item ta, 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 ta. this is this okay it basically tells you oh it's an instance of the item class located at this memory address somewhere this is the default way that an object or an instance will show itself unless you override the string method, the two string method. So if I go in there and I take this out, instead of the thing showing me its memory address, now I'm telling it, okay, I want you to show me the name, string variable, plus some little space, plus then the price variable, all in the same line. All right? So if I run this thing now, I want one thing, one, one ninety-nine, and then it shows you grapes two forty. Okay, which is this piece. Okay, so that's just a little quick refresher of how the two string business works. Any questions? Still awake? Okay. I gotta post that to you. Yeah, I already posted this, uh, but this, if you look at this, minimize, go to the, if you go to the next week, solution for one, I posted this stuff here. Okay, do you want me to post all this other stuff too? All the... Extra, extra things added, I can do that too. I'll just call it a lecture and upload it with today's video. Yep. Okay. Uh, going on, continuing with the item business. So this is how I create a single item. Okay, so this is just a way to, for me to group both of these two things into one place, called an item. And look at this. This is one class, which is outside of another class. So you have two different classes inside of the same file. Okay, one class, the bag, the bag class uses the item class. Okay, and it's, this is basically the idea of how we're gonna be doing things. We're gonna have one class that does some things, then you're gonna have another class that uses the first class. It will work the same way when we do link lists and all kinds of other things. Okay. You mean a different file? Yeah, yeah, you can do a different file, but I'll put everything in the same, in the same class. I mean, the same file. I do the same thing for for C plus plus. By the way, in C plus plus, you're supposed to have one one file with a header, and then another half file with a C, and then a third file with where it, where it runs, and then if you have, it's a pain, right? And it's a it, it's a miserable experience because 
debugging those is no fun, right? Things go wrong and you're like, wait, what? It works. I know it works. It looks like it should work, but it doesn't. But if you put all that stuff into one file, it actually simplifies debugging. And for me, it's more important for you to understand the data structures concepts and then trying to go through these like extra hoops where I make more, you know, your life more difficult. So yes, you. Yeah, 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 exactly. As long as, as long as all these uh, Java programs are saved in the same folder, they can see each other and they can interact with each other. And that's the reason why uh, a lot of times you're gonna see this public. A lot of, a lot of times you will see uh, the variables are private, 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 right? When you make something private, now these variables are not visible from the other classes that are inside the same folder. And that's what you want, actually. Okay? But I believe by default Java does this. It makes them private. And how do you change these variables which are private? The only way is through public methods, like public void hello, which is also, I think, Java does this by default. I just don't write them private and public. Okay? Not for this class. Okay? Uh, all right, so anyway, finishing up with the item business. This is how we make a single item. And then there's part four of the assignment. It tells you to make an array of item objects. No big deal, just like we can have an array of strings or an array of integers. That is exactly how we're going to do this with items, okay? <coughs> Any questions? And then I go in there, I basically do the same thing as I did before. Uh, oh, this is how you make the new items. All right, so basically what I'm doing is I'm saying, first of all, here I'm declaring an, an items array. This is me making the first element of the items array equal to an item, which is this little thing here. And then after that, I am saying that each item, each one after the first one, or starting at the second one, is equal to new item names prices. So basically I'm doing this business inside here. Okay? And then similar thing to what I did earlier, I have a sum, right? I check for to see if there's peace. I look for, I mean, I sum up all the information. That's why I had a get price for each of these items, right? My items class has a get price right here, which returns the price, okay? Uh, so I do all that here, look for the piece, add up all the things. If it has piece, I do this, and which is basically the same that I did earlier, similar to what I did here. And otherwise, I do this. And this one is average items. Notice what I'm doing is I'm sending the whole array of items here, okay, which is this here. Uh, trying to find it. This that I collapsed. Okay. So that was the review exercise. Review assignment one. The other one is uh, assignment two is similar. A bag of numbers. Uh, and that was the other one that I that you saw in the actual lectures, right? Part one is type up the listing 2.3 in the textbook, then add a method called get max, which finds the max, okay? Then change that, add another method called remove max, which doesn't just return it, but gets rid of, a, of the item in the back, okay? Any questions? Send me your emails, come see me. And that is all I have for today. So it will really help if you read through the book. So get the book, read through it, and that's all for week two. So I'll post this right now before I forget.